this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, give me still a few minutes. I didn't really know what else I could say with that, but yeah. We'll go <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Ah, all right. Hello. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, I'm Daisy Sanina, we're from the Bournemouth Film School um, at Arts University Bournemouth. Um, and I was wondering, just to start off, if you could just introduce yourself and say a little bit about what you do and how you got into it. Okay, I'm Fiona Shaw, I'm a writer, uh, novelist principally. Uh, I've written a memoir, um, four novels, and a ch four adult novels and a children's YA novel, um, which is my most recent novel. And how I got into writing, I was a literature student uh, and then went on to do a literature PhD writing about a poet called Elizabeth Bishop, who's a fabulous 20th century American poet. Got married and had two kids at the same time as writing a PhD, which I don't recommend. <laughs> I mean, the marriage thing or the relationship thing, fine, but not the kids. Much <laughs> well, it takes, maybe it takes a lot longer. Um, and then just after the birth of my second child, when I was just thinking, what do I do with this thing that I've now got called a PhD? I don't want to be an academic, but I want to be a writer, I want to write. I had a really severe postnatal breakdown. Very, like, it seemed to come completely out of the blue. So 10 days old, um, my baby was 10 days old, and I found myself back in a psychiatric hospital. Um, so that was a kind of really severe de depressive breakdown. And in the wake of that, I was trying to understand what on earth had happened. And so uh, I started writing in a way just to try and remember because my memory was really shot, partly through depression, partly through electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, which does terrible things to your memory. So, and what, so what it started as kind of really was a way of trying to work out what I could remember, what, I could, what I'd forgotten. And I asked other people around me to, if they could fill in some of the gaps. And then it grew, and I thought this would be something that would be good as a magazine article, and then it grew again, and it became my first book. Um, so that's how I got into writing, strangely. Uh, I was writing a book that I had no intention of writing beforehand and didn't know that I would be writing. Uh, and having written it and got it published, um, I thought, well, I'm going to carry on writing, but I'm definitely going to make things up from now on. <laughs> I do. I've had it, that's fine. The memoir's really important, and it's great that it's out there and good for other women to read, I got amazing letters, especially from old, old, much older women at the time, women whose age I am now approaching, um, to women in their 60s and 70s saying, it's so important this book is there, I've never talked to anyone about what happened to me, my GP didn't help me, my husband didn't believe me, you know, these t sort of heartbreaking or heart-rending stories about women and surviving depression. So that was the first one, and then I moved into writing fiction after that. Um, so that's the kind of very short version. <laughs> of, yeah. Um, so I've written fiction that's historical, mostly. Uh, my first novel was set in the mid 19th century and was in York, which is where I still live. And came out of moving back into York and thinking, God, this is an extraordinary city. And there were so many stories. Um, and ended up writing a novel about a fictional chocolate, a fictional Quaker chocolate factory. York has round trees in it, which is a, an actual Quaker chocolate factory. Um, and my novels have sort of moved forward in time, um, the, the adult novels. The, la the, the last of them goes into, moves into about the 1980s. Um, and I really, I'm interested how I've st I as a writer struggled with writing things that are set in the time that I actually live in. And I think part of it's thinking, how do I write technology, you know? Particularly as somebody who doesn't, you know, didn't, I wasn't born in social media or the internet. Um, so anyway, one way I've, answered that, it wasn't the reason that I wrote the book, but it's as it happens, what happens in the book is that I set a novel set slightly in the future. Um, so I moved from the 1980s to the future. My children's novel is set in a slightly future England, and it's about a gang of kids trying to get out of England to Scotland, and in the world of the book there is now a border. I started it in the run-up to the Scottish, re Scottish <laughs> referendum, actually. Really? Yes, because so that was rather than Brexit. Brexit hasn't even <laughs> been mooted. Um, so in the, but, in the, but in the world of the book, there's a border between England and Scotland, which is policed from the English side. The kids, for all different reasons, are trying to get to Scotland, because Scotland is the route to Europe, the route, route, route elsewhere. And there are people on Kent beaches trying to get out of England mm. in Robert Ingley's, you know, trying to make that crossing across the channel, but in the other direction. So it's, so, so in the novel, 
some things have changed, of course. You know, these decisions, have, these things have happened. And I was thinking, well, what's happened to technology? It's, it, it, surveillance would have increased. What do my kids have to do to stay, un, they, you know, not to get caught? And st as the novel goes on, the stakes get higher for them being caught. And I say, well, they'd, I think, well, they'd obviously have not, they couldn't use a phone and they couldn't use an iPad because they would immediately, as would happen now already, they would be traced. So I thought, great, <laughs> so, my, <laughs> so my characters can't use technology. In fact, they need not to use technology. Um, so in fact, that was a challenge in the book, was how, you know, how, they, how, they, have their, how they make their journey without uh, any money, because mon all money's on phones, of course, now, um, without using technology and so on. So anyway, I, didn't, I don't know quite how I got into talking about that's probably it's on my mind, so. but um, yeah, so that's, that's the kind of scope, the kind of, I suppose, the time scope of the novels that I've written. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering also, because like you say, like you've kind of almost gone through like a historical timeline, honestly, yes, kind of really. the stuff you were seeing in. Um, I was wondering in terms of just like the stories that you tell, are there any particular themes that you find coming up a lot, or like what kind of stories interest you that you want to tell? Well, that's, a good, that's a good question, but quite a hard one to answer. Yes, I should. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose all my... I think probably other people point things out about your work more than you, my, my work more than I, in ways that I'm not necessarily as aware of. Um, but I, there's some of the things that I know, I mean, every book that I've written has come out of some uh, question or thing that's pressing. So obviously the memoir, as I said, was trying to, well, that's rather different. That's trying to understand what had happened. Um, I wrote a novel set in the 19, early kind of 1920s, my second novel, The Picture She Took, which... Um, was actually I was writing it just after the Iraq war started, had was kicking off, um, and all those reports for those of us that were uh, adults then, alive and adults then, you 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 had reports of soldiers not knowing who the enemy were, because the enemy didn't they weren't all they weren't all dressed in fatigues, um, and I was then married to an Irishman, and was very interested in Southern Ireland from Republic of Ireland, and I was kind of interested in Irish history. And I was, so, I, so the novel anyway begins with a question. It's set around the time of the Troubles um, with the, when the Black and Tans were um, fighting in, and were sent over to Ireland to stamp out republicanism. And the Black and Tans have a, a properly infamous history as soldiers who did terrible things um, to the civilian population during that time. And the, some of the IRA did terrible things too, but the Black and Tans were really bad. And they have a reputation for being kind of psychopaths. And I thought, well, they can't have all been psychopaths. They won't, they won't have been. They won't all have been mentally deranged when they went over. And then they, but they found them. So my question was, what would it be like to be, what would it be like to be a man who goes over for one, goes over to be a soldier for one reason, finds themselves in a situation where they, where they find themselves doing things they could never have dreamed they would be doing. Um, and so that's, so that, that was, that was one of my characters in that, in that, um, in that novel. And the other, the other character is a woman who, for whom the First World War, this is just after the First World War, was the best time. And so that's her dilemma. Is for, for her, it was the best time because she had agency and she was free to, to live as a, and do things that she wasn't free to do in peacetime. Um, so she's, she's a, and she was based very closely on a character that I, on these two women I discovered, had set up as nurses behind, just behind the front line. Um, on their own, with no support from the British authorities, um, and started um, saving a lot of lives. And so once, they, once it was clear that what they were doing was making a big difference, they got a lot of support. But anyway, all their stuff is in the Imperial War Museum. It's mm. amazing. Their diaries and their, photo their photographs, wonderful photographs. So, so, that, so that novel began with, I suppose, the, particularly the, 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 the kind of what would you do if you were a soldier and you found yourself doing these things. Um, but also kind of my sense of I wanted two characters in balance, so I was thinking, well, what would it be like to be a woman? And, and then you th you're thinking, well, this was the best time for me. It was a time when this m number of million people died. Mm -hmm. um, and how now do I live with my, how do I live, how do I live going forward in the peace world when you can't do those things anymore? Not for, I'm not allowed to be the person that I was during that period. Um, so I think they've all begun with the question, to go back to your question. Um, I suppose there's a, there, there, there is a kind of politics that comes through probably in any writer's work as you gradually see them write more and more stuff, so that will be in there. And my politics are kind of on the left, so that's where kind of, yeah, that's where that will come through. Um, yeah. Um, Tents the Bees is a novel that 
has been adapted. It certainly began from a question. I fell in love with another woman um, and thought, and is the, who is the person I live with and have lived with for the last 15 years now, um, really. And I thought at the time, I've got two daughters, and I thought, um, what would it... And, and that's really, you know, family breakup is horrible for everyone, um, regardless of who, what, you know, what happens in the wake of it all. Uh, but I thought, if this had happened to me at another time in the UK, what, what would have been at stake for me? And that was, so that was the question that novel began with. Um, and when I started reading, I decided, I decided to set it in the 1950s because it was before I was born. So I thought I'd set it outside my own, my own lifetime. Um, but also I was pretty sure that, uh, that the thing you would be most frightened of as a woman with children would be that your children would be taken away. That if it, if, it, if it had gone to if, if you'd ended up in court, you, there's an absolutely no way you'd have been left with custody. Um, but what really took me back when I was reading was to discover that actually I could have set the novel in the 1970s in my own childhood, and that would still have been the case. And that was a bit of a hadn't realised that. Um, so that began with that question of what would be what would be what would you be most frightened of as the woman with the child in the novel? Um, be frightened that you'd lose your child. More frightened, I think, of that than from whatever had happened between you and, and the, the person you're falling in love with. Mm. Do you find that writing things in distinctly different time periods, uh, the distancing of it helps you with the w perspective of the world almost to, to a degree? Uh, that, that, that's a confused question, isn't it? But No, I think it's quite... Uh, I th is, what you're is what you're asking, does it help you sort of stand separately and see the world? Yes, to be yeah. kind of objective. Yeah, yeah. the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, I think I think I can have a fan it's probably a fantasy mm. or the illusion of some kind of shape to a world that I'm not currently living in. Mm. And it is an illusion, of course, because the world is just as messy <laughs> at any other time as it is now. But living in the now m with all the kind of um, confusion and mess, yeah, I find that I don't write out of those times. It's not conscious, but it's definitely what I've done. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, but good, good question, yeah. Mm. Yeah, sorry. Um, do we want to open it up to you guys then for a little bit? Any questions so far? I was, yeah, um, <laughs> was going to ask about, um, so you were talking about doing a literature degree and then moving into a PhD. I was mm. wondering if you could talk about that sort of transition and whether, like, did you do maybe a master's in between that or was it sort of straight into? Uh, I did do a master's, yeah. Um, I think I, I think back even back then it was kind of you know, really olden days, but I think you still had to do a master's. You'd had to do a master's pretty much, uh, but also I find it useful because I had the degree, the first degree I did, I did quite a lot of, um, and I chose the degree because it had very very few exams, and I hate exams and well, didn't mm -hmm. do very well in them. Mm -hmm. So I chose a degree in which you had to do lots of quite a lot of long essays as um, dissertation type length pieces for your first degree, but. Um, but the longest of that, and the longest of those was ten thousand words. But still, writing a PhD is sort of you know eighty thousand words. It's mm. quite a big beast. So actually, writing a dissertation for MA was useful in just having a sense of that it's possible to to do that kind of work and that kind of research. And and I'm really bad at structuring. Structure is the thing I think as a novelist as well as a the academic writing I did. I really struggle with. Um, so. People who can stand back at a problem, um, for which you could substitute novel in my case, um, and think, okay, so this needs to happen in this way, and this is the kind of this is the this is the line that it takes. I really struggle with that, so I have lots of ideas, but I structure is the thing I find most difficult. Um, so actually, in a way, I suppose writing the PhD was quite a, was really, I had a supervisor. It was really helpful to have somebody give me a kind of critique on those things, which then suddenly I was a novelist and it was all on my own doing. So, um, so that's, yeah, so that's not really quite to answer your question, but um, <laughs> I loved writing, I mean, I really did, I loved writing my PhD, not all of it, I hated some of the writing because it's mm -hmm. so solitary. Um, though that, I suppose, is also gives you quite a good, it's quite a good run up to being a novelist because that's very solitary. <laughs> um, uh, but I loved the material, and um, one of my biggest regrets, because of what happened to me in my life, was that I didn't do anything with it. Um, and it was that I finally, about three years ago, I finally gave a paper 
at a conference on Elizabeth mm -hmm. Bishop. Um, but returning after all this time uh, to that particular poet, about whom there was almost nothing written when I wrote my PhD, and now there's a kind of entire library written about, and I thought, well, I, I can't even begin to read all this. Uh, so I thought, well, actually, okay, what's, what, what's interesting to me now reading her? And I thought, well, I'm now a novelist, I'm now a writer, so I'm going to write a piece about being a writer in response to Elizabeth Bishop. So I finally did at least write, you know, gain, you know, recover something of all that, those years of writing. Um, are you interested in doing some postgraduate Potentially, work yeah. yourself? Potentially, yeah, so sort of interested yeah. in what the experience is like and, yeah. I think I mean I thought I think the other thing about doing an MA is although it is that it can is that although it's your you've only got a small group of people that you're kind of meeting with other students, it's not you're not jumping straight off into being on your own, which is just hard for talking. You need people to talk ideas with. I mean I still find that as a writer, as a writer, um, and writers and writers I know find um, different ways of creating that kind of you know, your kind of community around you. So I suppose that's another advantage about going from undergrad to MA is you, you still have other you have peers, and doing a PhD can be can, can be difficult to to find those people to have those people. Though I think universities, uh, um, so my university is much better at doing the one I teach in. They're much better at doing that kind of supporting students like that than they were back in the day when I was doing mine. So, what are you hoping to think uh, about doing? I'm doing creative writing at the moment, so potentially mm. following that or going into literature just something around words yeah. and language essentially words and language yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. <is> subtle. <laughs> yeah 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 well, i guess for for my creative the ma i teach in creative writing i think it's the same thing holds as it would for literature which is it do, gives some of the writers that come to my course are probably much less experienced than you'll be as writers and it gives them um it does definitely give them a kind of feedback group that they can you know, they get to know the people and they get to know who they can trust and who's and how people respond and it gives them that before and some of them then go on to do PhDs but um, I think having the MA at first is really helpful um, yeah it's not a very cogent answer but <laughs> thank you I was also wondering do you find that I, I'm, I don't know if you've obviously you've written your kind of biography and then the fictional pieces mm. do you find that writing in different mediums has helped you with um, your novels in the way that maybe I, I know obviously a lot of writers are kind of journalists and then go into mm. novelization do you think that having the discipline to kind of uh, work out how to engage an audience in different ways do you find that that helps you when you're writing fiction you've got so there's two questions I'm hearing from you, <laughs> which is one of which is about how you use one kind of writing to inform another and the other is a question about audience which is another whole bag um, well, I guess using one. one form to, to, to help, help strengthen another. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think for me, I mean, writers are so, you know, so many different people. People write in such different ways. Uh, I think the way it's helped me is, is that is, is it taught me to do? It taught me to research, or I or I had to do a lot of research and finding out about stuff. So I'm very good at doing that, and I but I also love it. Um, and loving it is also a potential downside as a writer, I think, because you can get so hung up on, you know, thinking about my Victorian novel, um, how somebody got out of a coach. You know, do they use a box? Is there a thing that folds down? Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing, that you can lose track of the story. <laughs> <laughs> or use it as a reason not to write the yeah. story. Um, so it's a real strength, but I think I have to, in my case, I have to check, sometimes check it. And so... I remember somebody saying, oh, I just put crosses in there so, um, if I'm trying to write a scene and I don't know the answer to something, but I haven't got, but I'm trying to guard my writing time and not get caught up in research. And I thought that's a good thing to do and you can do the research later. Um, but I remember doing an event with a friend who's a crime writer and we both live in York and we've both written novels in York and somebody asked a question about research and this friend said about a particular scene he'd written, he said, oh, I didn't go and, th they said, did you go and, did you go back to the Blue Bridge to see how, you know, the streets go and he said god no <laughs> you know so he was he was much more fast and loose about those sorts of things whereas i would definitely have gone back to the blue bridge <laughs> and walked it and taken photographs and so on um yeah um the, can i sorry yes just, just a follow-on question so linked to that research mm. and particularly your historical work um how much license do you feel you have in changing history 
mm. in terms of um, the, maybe the order of events that happen to particular characters or um, if they're based on actual um, his historical characters and events. Mm. Just playing that, playing with that in order to make the fiction work better. Yeah, yeah. So it's always an interesting question with people who write historical novels or his novels set back in time. I suppose there are kind of Hilary Mantel novelists who use act who who's, who's well not all her novels but obviously the Wolf Hall novels um, uh, actual events are at the centre of them. I mean events that really happened in some form or other. Um, and then there are and but then kind of I suppose the novels I've written have been set in back in time but I've created a fic so the chocolate chocolate factory is a fictional chocolate factory so in fact the material that goes into that description of that novel of that factory I drew on um, on material that came was was about was about Cadbury's which is another Quaker chocolate factory fries in Bristol another Quaker chocolate factory <laughs> so I kind of amalgamated um, or in the picture she took the um, Irish troubles novel um, it's very much, I, I named the, did the places, so Cork and West Cork towns are named in there, and I did a lot of reading about um, that period of um, Republican history. And I actually used one particular um, ambush, there's a very infamous, still infamous ambush that happened down in West Cork, uh, and in which the IRA ambushed some black and tans and some auxiliaries uh, and the argument still goes on as to whether the whether the men that were shot were shot in the back or not. So, i.e., did they defend them? Was it was it a cowardly ambush or not a cowardly ambush? And people still get up and leave rooms when people, you know, it's still it's still it's still very charged. So I so I but I wrote a fictional ambush. So I so anybody who knew that piece of history would read if they read the novel would think ah oh, she's writing about that ambush. But but by, but because I you know I thought I'm not going to get embroiled in. I'm, I'm definitely not going to talk about the actual people who were involved in the ambush because that was, that in a sense ties my story down too much. I can't write the story I want to write. And I can't introduce the characters I want to introduce. So that's how I get around it, um, is by creating a fictional town with a different name, um, but pretty close modelling of <laughs> some of the characters on actual figures who who were alive then. I was going to ask, how do you feel that your writing process has changed over the years, especially going from something relatively bi biographical, I suppose, to, mm. to fiction? Um, well, the relatively biographical one was just the first, mm. was the first, and was, was actually structurally the most, one of the most difficult I, to work out, um, how, to, how to put in these different narrative strands. There was my voice, there was my then husband and some friends who'd written pieces for me. I had my medical notes, which I'd asked for. Um, I had the books that I'd been reading to try and understand. There was a psychiatric history material. So there's a lot of different stuff. And, and I got it worked in one way. Then I worked on it with my agent when I got an agent. And then um, I can remember at one point with my agent, actually, before she sent it out, sitting on, on her sitting room floor with, uh, in those days, it was a Pritt stick and a, a pair of scissors <laughs> and splicing the, the narratives. Um, I've forgotten your question now. Just how your process has changed. Uh, so, that was, so that was a bit of my, so Pritt sticks, I don't use Pritt stick anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, so that was kind of maybe the most practically difficult because there were so many different strands and lots of them weren't things that I'd written. Um, my process has, uh, God, it's a difficult one to answer. <laughs> We're just here to ask you difficult questions. You're just here, yeah, <laughs> it's your job to ask difficult questions. I think in some ways my process hasn't changed that much. I, I mean, I don't know about everybody else, because I know that most of you here are writing in some form or other. Um, I still find some, I mean, I've got a friend who's a very successful novelist who has no self-doubt. <laughs> and, and, and she's written lots of novels and... Um, some of them, I think, are better than others. And I'm sure she probably would agree, but when she was writing the one that I think is less good, she still had no doubt about <laughs> it. Uh, whereas, uh, temperamentally, I am always full of, you know, ah, this isn't working, um, at, at the kind of sentence level, and then at the, not so much at the concept level, but definitely the sentence, paragraph, chapter levels. Um, and I don't think that's changed very much. <laughs> so, um, but I have a bank of published work that I can look and think, I have done it before. I can do it again. Mm -hmm. um, 
so I don't think my process has changed a massive amount. It was interesting writing the children's book as to what's changed because I thought, well, the pace needs to change clearly, and I need to row down on on description, on mood in a way. I need to get there faster, mm. otherwise my children are going to just shut the book. <laughs> so. So that was interesting because that didn't require didn't require me to change how I write, but it did require me to think a bit differently about how the story was functioning on the page. Um, but that was I mean I've really enjoyed that as well. Um, I find it slightly painful sometimes. I, I work by reading out. I, I don't know what anyone else does, but I read my work out to my partner, and it's always painful. I always find it excruciating. <laughs> I'm doing it for you know over a decade, and she says. God's sake, would you just get them to read that? <laughs> um, but she is a really fierce critic, um, which is good. Um, and, we, and, and then now, of course, the times with this new writing, she says, it's too slow, it's too slow. And I go, oh no, I'm going to have to lose the only bit of description I put in. Um, so I, that's, part of my, that's always been part of my process. I don't know, does anybody else do that? Does anybody else read their work aloud to mm -hmm. other people? Yeah. You yes. do. Mm -hmm. you, yes. do. You, do. you hate it, it, it you Yeah, do. it's like you realise... Everything it's e every it. doubt that you originally had <laughs> is just completely ex like exposed. Ex exposed. Yeah, and then it's there like, oh, actually, every single word in this, like in this dialogue or whatnot, just sounds ridiculous as soon <laughs> as you say it out loud. It's it's like with because I write kind of like sc screenplay wise, right. so then when I write it, it's kind of you have a way that someone says something. But when you're saying it out somewhere, you don't want to act it out either, mm -hmm. and it's just you almost have to write your own version of it. And then hand it over to people that can like can act. <laughs> to hear it. <laughs> yeah, to, to actually hear it in, yeah, the, way, yeah. in the way that they see these just, characters. Yes, you just maybe highlighted a different problem actually, or something that's more problematic in your form than my form, which is that your form is made to be performed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas if you're writing a story or writing a novel, you you do need to perform it because you do events and that kind of thing. But you can assume that mostly people are going to experience it inside their heads. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think the thing you said at the opening, which is, which I think is true about the quality of the writing, for, in my experience, which is, I start, I know, and I start reading it out, and I can see a sentence coming, but I think, oh no, that doesn't work, yeah, yeah. and I've got to read it. And I'm, it's like the fact of having an audience mm. that's external to me enables me to see something that I hadn't mm. seen, even though I might have been over that page, you know, four or five times and edited it and everything. So I always, I think it's, I find it enormously helpful. But it needs to be the right audience because somebody who's just going to diss it is not helpful. But also, your mum isn't necessarily going to be helpful if she just says, "God, you're so clever. You know, I couldn't do that." That's not necessarily useful either. So, finding a good um, listener, yeah, really valuable. So, who anybody? So, anybody else reading aloud? What's your experience? Uh, yeah, is. It's fine if I'm on my own. I'm just like a weirdo talking to myself. Yeah. Nobody's going to witness that. Um, but if I'm reading it to my partner, it's very much what, what you were saying. Every doubt that you've had yeah. is now vocalised, and then it's even worse when they agree. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, that doesn't work. And you're like, damn, I knew it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can be yeah. quite cringy, but it's really helpful, really helpful. in terms of critiquing yeah. it and knowing, okay, I definitely need to rework this. Mm. And, back to the drawing board sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes it can really clarify. You think, mm. oh, I just need to get rid of that middle bit of the sentence that I thought was essential. Mm. And I, just, I can lose it, and suddenly the sentence works. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I find it very, very helpful. But it doesn't, doesn't seem to get less painful to do. Mm. So, mysterious. That's not encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> for me, for me. <laughs> um, on a slight change of topic, I guess, because I really don't know much about publishing. But yeah. considering, one, how was it getting your first book published <coughs> and then transitioning from that? Did you find yourself pigeonholed because you'd written something that was autobiographical, suddenly transitioning into fiction? Was that difficult? What was that? I mean, the, the world of publishing has changed massively since mm. I published my first book because um, digital fiction has happened for a start. Mm. Um, but as far as, so to answer, the, the last bit of your question is the easiest to answer, which is I don't, I, I'm guessing because I don't know. I don't think that people get pigeonholed from writing a by writing a memoir because, in the nat I was thirty when I wrote that. In the nature of it, I wasn't. There wasn't. It wasn't like I had another memoir to write mm. that they that publishers would, would would want me to write instead of writing something else. So I think if you if you find yourself in the situation of writing something that comes out of your life that you, like that, then the plus is that people think, oh, she I like her the way she writes. I'll be interested to see what she does next. 
Um, I don't think you get pigeonholed. Uh, I think you're much more. That's much more of a, a thing if you say write a piece of genre fiction first, and the publisher says, well, that's great, but we want five of these, mm. um, or no, we're not interested in hearing about your literary novel because we want you to write another thriller. I think I do know people you know, who talk about that and the difficulty of breaking free, not for themselves as writers, but for the in getting their pu publisher to listen uh, or to take heed or to read. You know, um, I mean, in this country, as you probably know, getting an agent is is the thing you need. You, you really need to do as a fiction writer. Um, and there are, thank goodness, still small independent publishers who will take work directly and continue to, but of course they can't all the time mostly because otherwise they would never get any publishing done. But they're worth looking out for and all those competitions that offer it, you know, um, develop your, to develop your script or to develop your manuscript or to um, give you exposure to an agent or something, all those competitions or to publish your first book are really valuable. But getting an agent is kind of key um, and that's hard. Yeah. So. Um, I don't, has anybody here in a position where they're trying to do that or beginning to try to do that, thinking about it? I got my first rejection letter last Christmas, so okay. yeah, that was that was fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, frame it, you know, put it. In <laughs> and then well, it was an email, yeah. so I oh, had yeah, to print okay. it off. First. Yeah, <laughs> you print it off, and um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's difficult. To, it, I, when somebody asks me what to do about getting an agent, I would say. Um, don't send out to only one, because they are they remember that the agent isn't the person who's reading your work. It'll be one of their readers. Um, definitely only send what they ask for. I mean, never send stuff that they don't ask for because it irritates the life out of them. Um, and speaking as somebody who used to read for my agent, I know that. So if somebody sends a CD, um, locks of hair, food, you know, photographs, not useful unless there are you're asked for them. You know, they're asking for them, um, but. It's it is it's kind of brutal business, and it and if they don't if somebody doesn't like the first page, they won't read further, or they've got just taken on somebody, or they know that their agent has just taken on somebody writing similar kind of writing a very similar kind of work or something they deem to be, um, and do your research into maybe you've done all that, yeah, into kind of into into you thinking well there's no point sending to an agent who mostly represents romance writers or doesn't like literary fiction or doesn't seem to have any thriller writers on their list if that's what you're writing. Um, and also know that a lot of very good writers get a lot of rejections before they <laughs> get taken on. Um, yeah. But it is, it's hard, it is tough that. How did you see your agent? Uh, well, I suppose because I was, and I think this has changed as well, but writing non-fiction I think is possibly a more straightforward ask than writing fiction. Um, so I, there were a couple of agents, one of the agents had come, somebody, there was a, I was doing a PhD, my PhD, I think it can't have been actually, it was post-PhD. Um, anyway, I went to, back to York, which is where I'd done my PhD, and there was a kind of event where they got agents and publishers to come talk to students. And so one of the agents I went to, I got in contact with after that, she said, send me your manuscript. Um, the other agent was recommended to me by, by my supervisor and she just started as an agent so she didn't have much of a list yet. That's another good thing to look for in young agents because they're hungry to build their list and often have more scope to take people on. Um, so I sent it out to t those two and they both said, yeah, okay, come, we'll, let, come meet. You know, they were interested. Um, and the, I went to meet them both in London and the first of them said, this is great, I think you might need to change your name because you've got the same name as an actress. Mm. And I was really <laughs> pissed off about that. I really <laughs> thought, what? Um, and she said, I think we could just publish it as it is. Yeah, pretty much, it's great. And I was sort of thought, I'm not com completely convinced about that because I, I found it structurally so difficult and it felt a bit, un I knew it was a bit unwieldy but I didn't know how to change it any further. The second agent I met and she said, I think you can write, but I'm not prepared to take you on without you doing a lot more work on this novel. But I'm happy to work with you on that, and then we can reconsider, we can think about it. And then she talked about what she wanted me to do on this memoir, sorry. And she talked about what she thought was, was wrong with it, um, why it didn't work. And I thought, yeah, you're the person I want. I mean, absolutely no question. And the things she said were so, you know when somebody says something to you and you think, oh yeah, of course, it was like that, even though it was quite a substantial thing to do. So she then be did become my agent. So so that's the answer. But um, And I suppose those kinds of things do happen you know, in, in universities a lot now. So you, 
m you know, use those opportunities. <laughs> kind of be, yeah, be assertive and aggressive about them, I think, mm -hmm. as far as you can. Yeah. Any other questions? Can I ask you a question about um, letting the work go, which is almost is related to the rejection and the, the yeah. sense that you work something, you invest everything in the work, and they t tell it to the bees. So there's that process of, of letting the work go to other people to work on, both trusting you know, the editor, um, but and also in this you know in the exceptional um, relationship of actually handing over the work to scriptwriters, mm. and you're not involved in that process. Mm. Could you talk a little bit about letting the work go? Do you mean it, do you mean expressly in terms of an adaptation of your book, or do you mean in terms yes. of letting the work go as if you're writing a novel and getting it published? Yes, that that or, as or both. That, just that, yeah. that emotional journey and yeah. um, and the resilience that one needs, and or at the point at which do you, do you yes. how can you learn to um, in script writing you call it kill your babies, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's um, which is unfortunate. Murder um, your darlings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, but also to just generally become much more. Um, I, I, I to the pro yeah, to the emotional yeah. Because there are two kind of things. I mean, there's a kind of question as a novelist of letting your work go mm. when you decide, okay, it's going to get published in this form, and it's and there are things I'm sort of maybe you know not 100 percent sure of, or I, but I can't I can't write any. I suppose what I feel is, um, and I know to be true now, is that the point at which a book gets published is the it's the best I can make it at that t that moment in time. Um, but I know because I've revisited books that I've published were published years ago. But if I revisit them ten years later, there are all kinds of things I think. <laughs> well, it seems clear to me now that what needs to change is this. Um, so I sort of have a. Um, I think I think that about my books and about other people's books sometimes, where I think, uh, which is I know that it was the best that the writer could make it at that point in time. Doesn't mean it's perfect, um, but you, you and that's that's and I and I feel quite kind of okay about that. Um, this this one of the, I put two of my novels onto Kindle myself because they were sold, they were published before they were digital rights, so I had the rights. So I thought, well, I'll put them back up there. They're out of print, I'll put them back up on Kindle. And the second of them, which was the, the one set in the Irish Troubles, as I was, you have to get it scanned and it produces all these glitches and you have to correct them. And so I was reading it very carefully to put all the, get rid of all the glitches. But I thought, God, this is so overwritten. So, and so I cut 10,000 words from the digital version. Um, so that, you know, that was, had been, it had been out for 10 years or so, and so, so it, I was thinking differently as, as, as a writer. So um, as far as letting it goes, go for adaptation, um, that's a much, that's a bigger, that's a bigger thing, I think, because, um, so I, I sort of decided once I said, okay, yes, option it, and, and I saw the first draft by a different script writer, actually, than the script writers who did the final shooting script, um, I thought I need to just make my peace with this because it's not it, I'm sort of giving it's now not my baby it's not my darling these are not my darlings they're somebody else's and and I know the script writers will ask me for notes uh, which they did and um, they listened they read them they responded politely um, they took note of a few things and ignored most and that's happened to <laughs> several and I thought okay it's not my it's not my thing you know I made a I made the novel and that's my object, and they're making a film, and that's theirs. Um, so that's sort of how I did it. Um, I th I obviously, I think if I'd been involved in the script writing process and taken that decision, even if I hadn't been the script writer who did the, did the final script, that might have been much harder, perhaps. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, what you're working on now is you have a new novel in the works anything I um, I do but it's very very early um, in fact it's 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 earlier than I thought it was going to be because I I'm starting on a second outwalkers novel the my children's novels called outwalkers and I'm writing a, a second one not a sequel exactly but a one in the same world mm -hmm. with some of the same characters um, but and I've written about 20,000 words and sent it to the editor, the, 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 our editor, with a synopsis and had a really useful, com very, very helpful conversation about it. Um, it's the first time I've worked like that with an editor where I've sent them the work in draft. And the really useful conversation was just before I went away to a writing retreat for a month. 
and he said, and I've written it from the point of view of the same character as the first, uh, as the same first book. And he said, my editor said, I really like this story, and I'm really, I'm very engaged. I'm really engaged by it. I'm completely behind it. Mm -hmm. But do you think it's that character's story? And I thought, oh shit, he's right. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not his story. It's this other character's story. And so, of course, the question co coming on that is, who should be telling the story? So having written 20,000 words, it took me a year. I've just jettisoned them and had to start again from the other character's point of view. Mm -hmm. So that was so. It was just a kind of thing. So, you know, I've done, got, I've got sort of, I haven't written however many books, and I still, it took me, it took somebody else to point that out to me. I think, God, how could I be so... I just assumed it would be from the same character's point of view. Mm -hmm. So I am starting on a, on a sequel, a second book rather, not a sequel, mm -hmm. not a sequel. Um, mm -hmm. But it will take me two or three years probably to draft it. Mm. I, I was going to ask if you preferred writing the children's fiction since you, you've gone to, to write a second book on that, but with the rewriting of it, <laughs> that might not be the uh, case. Um, I, th I put down a novel to write the first Outward Walkers book that I was probably written 30 pages of or 40 pages. And I went back to it a while back to think, shall I go back to this? And thought, no, I want to write the second Outwalkers book, but I do want to go back to that story. Mm. Um, and I'm sure it will be different when I go back to it, as I've been saying, because it's so, when you go back to things over, after, over time, mm. you just never, you know, that, you, you, don't, you don't step back into the same book somehow. Mm. Um, but I would like to, I do want to go back to it, but the Outwalkers stories, I suppose maybe because they're political, partly. They're very much stories, they're very much adventures, but they are written about the world that we're in now. They feel kind of more pressing to me. So at the moment I'm staying with those. There's another question, I'm sorry I keep asking questions, but um, which was about that, the, the time it takes to write something. Yes. And therefore, in, in particular in its relationship to Brexit now, Mm. Um, by the time that the, uh, the work is published, the world will have changed. It will, yeah. So uh, how, do you, <laughs> how do you cope with that, do you feel, as a, as a, as a writer? Um, yeah, and this is new, quite new to me, because this is the first time I've written, uh, most of my yeah. books have been in the past. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, at the moment, one of the questions I'm thinking is, what's going to have happened to children's protests and environment protests? Mm -hmm. what, what, might, what might possibly come out of that? And I'm thinking particularly about, not about England, but about Europe, actually, or the, in my novel, Europe is Elsewhere, as indeed it seems like it might or might not happen. I don't know, God knows. Um, so it's a good question. And, and I sort of sometimes wonder whether, you know, in a sense, the, the events of the world as we're seeing it now might overtake the events of my story. Um, I don't quite, I can't answer better than that, because I just don't know. Uh, yeah, and I can see that technology might well overtake what I envisage for my novel. Um, but I suppose it may be more, I was interested to see Ian McEwan's new novel he's just brought out is set in the 1980s. Yeah. And I thought that's, a, and it's about virtual reality and automata and so on. I thought that's quite a canny way of making sure that your, your story isn't overtaken by yeah. <laughs> technological yeah. developments before it comes out. Um, yeah, but it's a good question, but I think, yeah, I. Don't know. I uh, yeah. I can. I can only. I can. I try to. I'm trying to second guess. Um, but I don't want to write it. I. I definitely not. I'm not a science fiction writer. I don't want to write a kind of futuristic. a futuristic time. I was. I'm trying to write a world as much like the one we know as as I can. So I might be overtaken by events. Um, one. I've. This is going completely back again. But why writing in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> why writing? Why why be a writer? Why yes, write? What, what was it about writing that you thought this is what I actually want to do with my life? Uh, I've always been a reader. Mm -hmm. I've, in fact, I've never met a writer who isn't a reader. Mm. Um, never met a prose writer. I have I have had people come onto my MA uh, who who say they want to go and write screen, want to be screenwriters, but uh, who say they don't read. And I think mm -hmm. what? And I think they get. They certainly get told by the various of us teaching them that if they want to be a good screenwriter, they're going to need to read. Um, you know, they need to read scripts for sure, but they also need to read other stuff. So I've always been, I've always read a lot, and I think maybe that's why for me, um, writing has for a long time been a way of trying to understand and work out what I think, mm. um, because some, that strange thing that happens when you 
In fact, it can happen you know, where you think your ideas are clear in your head and you go and try and write them down and you think, I, yeah, I've lost it, I have had a hold of it. But the pro, but the, but, and that can happen, but the, but the process of writing is how I work out what I think about something, I think. So that's probably why. Mm. Are there any other writers, apart from Elizabeth Bishop, of course, that you've found have been really influential in that? Loads. Loads and loads. <laughs> Give me th- um, <laughs> and I suppose I uh, can often find that the writer I'm... Mo- the com- I, do, I'm I think mimicry is really good. I, I think sometimes my st- students say, oh, but I, I really like this writer, but I'm really worried I'm going to be... Um, plagiarising or and I say no don't worry you won't plagiarise you might learn some things um, and I think so I think sometimes I find myself inhabiting another writer's sentences or structure you know the way that they happen to write structure or um, but I don't I think that's fine because then that you incorporate something from them that you think you really like or that you want to try to emulate or find your own way with and then it becomes part of your own writing um, so Lots of writers. I mean, recently I just read Milkman recently, which, uh, and I'd never read anything about Anna Burns, hadn't come across her, although she had been, her books have been sh- shortlisted for prizes, but she won the Booker Prize, and so the things people were saying about that, I thought, this sounds interesting. And I was completely blown away by it. Just thought, this is an amazing writer. So I just bought her second novel, and it was only her third book. I just bought her second novel, thinking, I'm never going to write like her but I love what she's doing with language and it's very funny and it's um, quite ma- it's mannered but it's so clever as a way of writing about the, again the Irish Troubles actually in the north so she's somebody I just happen to be reading, reading now um, there are some great young people writers that I'd never come across because again writing a children's book I thought I'm really out of date my kids are well grown up so I, I was reading kind of Harry Potter and you know, Dark Materials back in the day but there's just a entire kind of universe of children's fiction that's come out since so I've been reading lots and lots of children's fiction but there's so much that yeah so I've been really enjoying that um, I, mean, I read Mohammed Khan's I Am Thunder first novel amazing I thought this piece of realist fiction about growing up as, as being a, as a thriller set in London 16 year old Muslim girl written in her voice and he's a male maths teacher in his life um, or Matt Killeen is another first novel I thought was really good as a YA novel set in um, called Orphan Monster Spy, which is a kind of Jewish girl who finds herself in, um, in set in the Second World War and imagines a Jewish girl who finds herself in a kind of Nazi boarding school. And it sounds implausible. I mean, at one level, of course, it is, but it's a really powerful kind of exploration of intolerance. And, um, I mean, you always have to have plucky, plucky heroes and heroines, so she's very plucky, but... <laughs> so, yeah, so I, ra- I, ra- I read a lot and range around. Any last questions? No? No? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, in that case, I think we'll round this off, but thank you okay. very much for doing this. And it's uh, a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.